Welcome! In this video, you're going to learn three ways you can boost your Python code today. To make it concrete, we're going to work with Python's date class. Usually class names are capitalized, but this one is not, and it's simple. It takes the year, month, and day. You also have time delta. This class represents the difference between two points in time. Time delta has a bunch of features, but we're going to use just one. It has an attribute called days. That's the number of days in the interval of time it represents. Let's imagine our program has a few functions for working with dates. The first is called count days in range. Give it a start date and an end date, and it returns an integer. We can code this in one line. End minus start gives us a time delta, and its days attribute almost gives us the answer. We just need to add one to it to include the first day. Here's another called date in range. This takes three arguments, a target date, start, and end. This answers a yes or no question. Is this target date in the range or not? And this one can also be a one-liner. Again, imagine we're using this several times in our code and we want to enforce consistency so that no one does a less than when they should be doing less than equal. We protect against errors like that by writing a function. Okay, what do these functions have in common? They both take start and end date arguments. And this is a big clue. You wanna look for this. Whenever you see two or more functions that have the same argument in common operating on the same object, that means you can combine them into a class. Here's the procedure. First, identify the common argument or arguments. Most of the time you'll just have one, but in this case, we have two arguments in common, start and end. Next, you create a class and give it a constructor that takes those arguments. And in the constructor, just store them on self. Then you go through each function one at a time and you just convert it to a method. I'll show you how to do that in a second, but that's it. Once you've done this, you have a rock solid class you can immediately start building on. So let's do this. We're going to call our class date range. Now this constructor takes start and end. Those are the common arguments and what we want to store on self. But we check to make sure that the start date is not after the end date. If that is not true, then we raise an exception. This is already a big win. Our functions did not have this sanity check, but all of our methods will. Let's convert our first function, count days in range. See how it takes start and end and uses them in its body? We want to convert this to use self.start and self.end instead. The first step is to remove those arguments from the signature and of course add self. Then we put them in the function body and everywhere it references start, replace that with self.start and likewise for end. And we get to make the name shorter. When it was a function, the name had to be longer to tell you what it was for. But when you convert it to a method, the class gives context, so you can usually shorten the name. Next, we want to convert date in range. But let's add something to upgrade our Python skills while we're at it. That something is writing unit tests. And there's no other way to put this. Writing tests is a superpower. There is no coding skill you can learn that will level you up faster and higher than learning to write tests. This is one of the key skills used by the very best coders on earth. And once you master it, it will transform your life. Let's see how it works. A unit test is a piece of code that you write and its purpose is to test other code, meaning to verify that it actually works. And when the code that you are testing works, we say that the unit test passes. But when the code you're testing does not work, when it has a bug, we say that the test fails. And the best part is that your unit test tells you exactly what went wrong. So you do not have to guess. You immediately see what needs to be fixed and how. This will save you so much time because sometimes we have a working program and then we add a new feature that we need. And too often, this will accidentally break something that was working before. Unit tests keep your program working correctly. They will alert you when something accidentally breaks, pointing exactly where the problem is. So you do not have to dig. You can just fix it immediately, removing a lot of stress. Before we apply this to date range, let's warm up with a really simple function. 
we're going to use the unit test module, which ships with Python, and we will write a test for a simple function called double. It just takes a number and multiplies it times two. Here's how you write a unit test for it. You want to use a class called test case. This is part of the unit test module that ships with Python. And you're going to create a subclass, which we will name test functions. In that class, we're going to define one method called test underscore double. We call this the test method, and it forms the basic structure you follow when writing a unit test. What we're going to do is define the value we expect double to return, if it is working correctly. And then we measure the actual value it returns. And then on the last line of our test method, we invoke a method called assert equal. This is a method of the test case class, and it takes two arguments, the expected value and the actual value. This is what actually checks whether our function is working correctly or not. Now, imagine we have a bug in our function. It multiplies by three instead of two. So when we run the test on the previous slide, it lets us know there's a problem. Look at this output, failed in all caps. And it tells us exactly what went wrong. Even the line in the test file with the failing assertion. This is so useful because often you will have many of these assertions dozens, maybe more. And this output tells you exactly what went wrong and where, so you know what to focus on and fix it. So we fix this function, replace three with two, and look at the output now. A simple okay tells us that our test has passed and our code works perfectly. Now we are ready to go back to date range. And we still need to convert the date in range function and turn it into a method. So let's do that by writing a unit test. To show what we're testing, we're going to take date in range and turn it into a method called in range. And it takes one argument other than self, the date that you are checking, returning true or false. Here's our test file. It's called testDateRange.py. We import test case, and we also import the date class. But notice we also import date range from another file. This is normally how you do it. You put your application code in one file and your tests in a different file. Then you just import whatever you want to test. In this case, the date range class. So we create a subclass called test date range and a test method named test in range. That's where the action happens. We start by creating an instance of date range covering a few days in the year 2052. And we are going to use a pair of new assertion methods called assert true and assert false. These work like assert equal, but just take one argument and the test passes if that argument is true, or if it's false, depending on which one you choose. So we call dr.inRange twice inside these two assert statements, passing in a date that we know is actually in the range and another date we know is not. Now we are set up. We can implement the body of the inRange method, confident that our test will tell us if we got it right. Then we run the test and sure enough, it works. This is called test-driven development where you write the unit tests first and then write the actual code after. And you know it works when you see the test pass. We have one more Python booster to learn about today. And to do that, let's add another method to date range. Specifically, we want to use our date range object in a for loop. Makes sense, right? Because it is actually an ordered sequence of dates, kind of like a list. So we will want to use it in a for loop sooner or later. To do this, let's create a new method called days. That returns a sequence that works in a for loop. But how do we want to implement this? Because there's something else we want to think about here, and that is memory efficiency. To explain what I mean, imagine this function called fetch squares. It's pretty simple. It just builds a list of square numbers for you up to some limit. In fact, we could imagine it as building a list of other more complex objects. But what's important here is not whether it holds square numbers or not. What's important is the fact that it returns a list. Look at the second for loop here. It is going through the square numbers in this list one at a time. But I want you to notice something because it turns out this can be extremely inefficient and wasteful. Here's why. What if the number of squares in the list is not just five numbers? What if it is much larger, maybe thousands, maybe a million or more? In that case, the for loop cannot even start until you've created the entire list. And as soon as that for loop is done, you just throw that list away. 
but it gets worse. Imagine you're not just squaring a number, but something more complex, something that taxes the CPU more or has to make a slow API call over the network. By using fetch squares, you have murdered the performance of your program. So is there a better way? In fact, there is. Here's the solution. Realize that the for loop does not need the whole list to start. It only needs one element at a time. So that is what we are going to give it. And the key is a special feature of Python called a generator. This is a special Python object which produces the elements one at a time. Here's how it works. A generator looks a lot like a regular Python function, but instead of a return statement, it contains a different keyword called yield. This makes it act completely different because once it computes each value, it waits. It does not compute the next value until the for loop is ready for it. So instead of computing the whole list at the beginning, it only remembers one value at a time. This is a complete game changer for the performance of your Python code. First of all, your program is snappier and more responsive because it never has to stop to compute a giant list. And because of that, it will also have a smaller memory footprint. That makes everything work better. And third, even with large data inputs, the lower memory footprint means that your operating system will not need to use virtual memory. So your program will just run faster. In short, you want to use generators as much as you can. It makes everything better in every Python program you write. By now, I bet you're excited to use generators. So let's do that with date range. Remember, we need to make a new method called days. And this method needs to return a sequence that you can use in a for loop. And generators are perfect for this. Here's how we do it. For the most part, it looks like a regular method. We say def days and create a kind of pointer variable called current. And we yield that instead of returning. So days produces just one date object at a time. Each iteration through, we just add one day to it. And we have to use time delta for that, which is fine. And we continue until current reaches the end date. Let me demonstrate this on the Python prompt. We call dr.days, and we store it in a variable called day underscore sequence. Let's check its type. It is something called generator. That makes sense because days is a generator method. And then we go through it in a loop, for day in day sequence. And look, it produces each date in order, one at a time. Now, if you want to master all this, I have written a transformational ebook called Powerful Python, teaching everything we have talked about and much more. Here's what Daryl Fee, a software engineer in test, says about it. Powerful Python is among the best books available for taking your Python skills to the next level. There are very few books which offer the sort of insights needed to really improve skills. This is one of the few I can highly recommend for those who are struggling to achieve intermediate skill in Python. Here's what Nick, a data scientist from Colorado, says. What have I found good and valuable about the book so far? Everything, honestly. The clear explanations, solid code examples have really helped me advance as a Python coder. Thank you. It has really helped me grasp some advanced concepts that I felt were beyond my abilities. And to sum it up, here's what CTO John Beaufort says. Reading powerful Python feels like Neo learning jujitsu in the Matrix. I can't really add anything to that. So what do you learn in powerful Python? Chapter 1 gives you a different way of thinking. The elite Pythonista mindset. So you can succeed with the most important programming language on Earth today. Chapter 2 dives deep into generator functions. Far beyond what we covered so far into the design patterns of scalable composability. Chapter three is about a Python feature called comprehensions, useful for creating lists in a high level way that is easy to work with, readable and very maintainable. But beyond that to dictionaries and other data structures and with a surprising connection to generators, chapter four goes into advanced ways to use Python functions, creating more generic and flexible function definitions and Python's higher order function object abstraction. Chapter five builds on this to teach you to write decorators, one of the most powerful features of the Python language and one which 99% of Python developers will never learn. Chapter six teaches you all about Python's error model, how to use exceptions to signal out of band 
and even use Python's built-in exceptions in your own code. Chapter 7 focuses on OOP, not the basics of classes and methods, but going beyond that to the uniquely Pythonic design patterns and the advanced tools of Python's object system. Chapter 8 goes fully into writing automated tests and test-driven development. Remember, this is a coding superpower, and this chapter gives you all the tools you need to succeed. Chapter 9 is about logging. This is a priceless tool to get real-time information about the behavior and internal state of your program useful to accelerate troubleshooting, and the foundation of application monitoring. You also get two exciting bonuses. The first comes from Q&A sessions I have hosted for powerful Python readers. In fact, you get over three hours of these recorded sessions as an exclusive free bonus. This is not available any other way. The next bonus is a full course on the topics we previewed in this video, covering object-oriented programming, test-driven development, and scaling with generators. This course quickly covers these advanced basics so that you can confidently build your skills. And it even includes self-grading coding exercises with full detailed solutions. Yours free when you purchase Powerful Python on this page today. When you read Powerful Python, you're not alone. In fact, thousands of Python pros worldwide have read and benefited from it, transforming their skills and leveling up their Python beyond what they thought possible. To get Powerful Python and the bonuses right now, click the button below.